welcome to Atop the Fourth Wall, where bad comics burn. Today, we're going to review a Spawn comic. Whoa, whoa, take it easy, people, take it easy. Okay, there are a lot of fans of Spawn out there. I admit, I'm a very casual fan of the character, meaning I like his concept, I like his visual aesthetic. However, I admit I've never actually read Spawn before, and that's kind of why I'm doing this. Back during Secret Origins Month, many people were asking me to take a look at some indie-created characters like Spawn. Fair enough, but Spawn isn't even 20 years old. I wanted to look at the origins of characters stretching back much older than that. The other reason why people want me to look at Spawn is that he's another character from Early Image Comics. As we have stated many, many, many times, Early Image sucks on toast for most of it. For a lot of people, Spawn was different from the Youngblood-style idiocy that we frequently saw, and we can probably thank its creator for that, Todd McFarlane. McFarlane is an artist and writer whose mainstream work began at both Marvel and DC. I'd tend to describe his artwork as a bit chaotic, but gothic in its own way. His artwork is very easily recognized for the level of detail he puts onto things. It's probably best shown in this, the cover of the Spider-Man title that he both wrote and drew, after leaving a previous Spider-Man book because he no longer wanted to draw other people's stories. I've complained once or twice about the haphazard way some artists have drawn Spidey's webbing, and it can be traced back to McFarlane. It's not that I don't like detailed webbing, it looks very impressive. It's just that when the webbing is going in five different directions that Spidey didn't aim, it becomes a little excessive. You'll recall also that Image Comics began when several Marvel artists decided to break off and form their own company, and McFarlane was one of them. It's there he created Spawn, and there where we're looking. Because I haven't actually read Spawn before this, I'm going to take a different approach with this. I'm not going to give any details in this introduction of what I do know about Spawn. We're going to pretend like this is 1992, Spawn just hit the rack, and we're walking into this blind. The question is whether or not this will hold up or even hold our interests. And yes, before anyone comments, I do own the Frank Miller penned Batman slash Spawn comic. We'll be getting to that later this year. In the meantime, let's dig into Spawn number one. Luster. Don't get me wrong, it's well drawn, but it's just Spawn posing. I'll give credit for the fact that he's in a more dynamic pose than, say, Xena number one, but it doesn't help the fact that it's just a pinup of him. This is poster bait, not a comic book cover. Also, why the purple silhouetted bat? Actually, it doesn't even look like a real bat. It looks like a bat cut out of paper with frayed edges everywhere. We open in Spare! You know the rest. I don't belong. I don't belong to the light. I don't belong to the thunder. I don't belong in the sounds of the words we've both fallen under. Not here. Not now. I have to get back there. The bet was rigged. He made me believe. That gecko lied to me! Geico wasn't any better! Now there's darkness in my soul. And darkness in the panels, as we can see. I want to die. Again. But I chose to come back. Why? You have five seconds to answer! We cut to a series of news reports providing a whole ton of exposition for us. 
I admit it's a little high on the wordy side, but props for getting a lot of the backstory out of the way quickly for new readers. One question I do have, though, is why the visuals of the news reporters are just copied and pasted on both sides. The expressions aren't different, the images aren't varied, it's just two of the same images next to each other. Why? Anyway, it tells the story of Lieutenant Colonel Al Simmons, who died in 1987 after he saved the life of the president. Well, already they've got it wrong. That was Booster Gold. He apparently disappeared from public view after the Hinckley incident, and they mention Youngblood since this is yet again early image, where they were pretending that all of their books take place in the same universe. I remember there was someone. Someone to love. Someone to hate. And I was something. I was purple and I was proud. Then they turned on me. He turned on me. DAMN YOU, SKELETOR! Basically what we get from this nine panel structure for two pages is that he was dead and that someone betrayed him in his real life. After he died, a demonic being, most likely the devil, made a deal with him so he could return to the woman he loved. This is the best kind of origin story for a superhero. It's very simple and can be explained in a few sentences. There are enough details not provided that they can be filled in later, there's a very human element to the character's motivation, and a viable storytelling engine. For at least three different kinds of stories. Romantic ones where he tries to be with the woman again, revenge-based ones where he attempts to find the guy who betrayed him in life, and potential for enemies based on the nature of his resurrection, ergo being brought back by a demon. Oh, and you want to know the real kicker for a storytelling engine on top of all of that? His memory was taken as well. If I can just find her, then I'll know what this is about. But I can't even remember who she is. I feel I can do anything, anything at all with my power. Except get my pizza in a reasonable amount of time. It's been three hours for crying out loud. So after Spawn finishes looking at his invisible watch, we have a two-page horizontal spread that needs to be turned on its side. Once again, it's not a bad image, but why? Why must I turn it to its side? Is it so much of a bother to condense this down to one page? Also, the other unfortunate aspect of this image is that we see Spawn's cape trailing down over the edge of the rooftop and wrapping around a pole. This basically means that when he walks away, there's going to be a comical moment where either his cape rips off his back or he trips. We cut to a crime scene where a hitman was apparently thrown through a window from the 44th floor of a building. And he wasn't killed by the fall? No, sir, it was his heart. Heart failure? Um, you might say that, sir. It was removed. Removed? Yes, sir. It was stuffed in his mouth. Hey, sometimes a guy just gets really hungry. He exposits that three other hitmen in the last 48 hours have been killed, meaning that it's likely there's a vigilante on the loose. We then cut to classic superhero cliché number 37. A hero's status as an ass-ticker is established via rescuing a woman either being robbed or raped. A corollary of that cliché is the absolute moron who thinks he can take a guy who looks like this. I'm gonna carve me a super ha ha Hey, that actually did wonders for my throat! Thanks, man! Live to serve, citizen. Nah, the guy gets tossed out a window. I wonder if that's going to be Spawn's signature move. Spawn asks who's next, and of course the moron parade continues. You crazy MF, nobody jerks with me! And no, that wasn't me censoring myself, it really says crazy MF. Fat boy, you're way out of your league. And he creates a glowing green light that flies past them and explodes. My powers include super strength and small firecrackers. Truly I am a spawn of Satan! After the gang runs away, Spawn suddenly has some sort of weird migraine and a flash of visions, along with this lovely image. No! Bubbles! Bubbles all around me! He's hit by more visions of the woman he's looking for and of his own funeral. Also, for some bizarre reason, there are spider webs covering everything. I guess Todd McFarlane hadn't quite gotten over not doing Spider-Man anymore. Then the vision of his funeral changes, and the crying woman he's been looking for turns into a snake demon thing. Well, some people dream about showing up to work naked, and some people dream about their wives becoming hideous snake demons. It happens. Hey, come on, it's okay. You're alright. It's all over now. And then, everybody laughed at me, and said I was a wiener, and said my cape looked fakey and stupid. <laughs> 
once again check in on the newscasters, only now it's 1992 instead of 1987, and the names of their stations have changed. Really, it provides no real exposition except for three different types of newscasting. The first being actual news, the next one being an opinion piece about how the new vigilante is doing a good thing, and the last from a stereotypical fashion designer. I mean, let's get serious. A cape? With the young blood fashions being all the rage, why on earth would anyone try to bring back such a gauche and totally useless accessory? Because I don't care what anyone says! Capes are cool! Now, those spikes and chains he has, those are simply darling. That won't look dated at all in the next few years. Just you wait. As Spawn travels through the alleyways, he realizes that the woman he keeps seeing is his wife. In a neat little bit of writing, he realizes that's the only thing he can remember about her, not even the color of her eyes. Though we need to ignore the fact that he keeps seeing the same image of her, so why doesn't he see her eyes? He thinks that he's becoming too caught up in the costume and needs to get it off. However, as he starts discarding parts of it, he looks at his own skin and realizes he's horribly burned. We cut to one last look at the cops, who speculate about things that aren't actually important. And then they make a donut joke, which is always comedy gold when it comes to cops. And so our comic ends on a spiral of laughter. Somewhere in time. Simmons, if you think you've got problems now, I promise your troubles have just begun! <laughs> oh, sometimes you just gotta laugh. Next issue, The Violator. Okay, I think that's a good place to stop. This comic does not suck. In fact, out of the titles that came out of Image when it first started, this is probably the one that I'm willing to give the most leeway to. The premise isn't bad at all, the artwork is pretty good for image standards, and there are plenty of good moments. I hesitate, however, to call it good. The brief story bits we have are good, but it also feels like there's too much padding. I can't help but feel that this would have really benefited from an oversized issue. It's not a complete story, and it doesn't have a traditional story structure to it, meaning it just seems to end out of nowhere. So yeah, to people who worried that I was going to bash Spawn, that's not the case. But for fans wanting my boundless rage, we'll get back to Spawn later this year. Next week, though, it's time to check back in with everybody's favorite artist in the universe, Rob Liefeld. Yes, I've seen the Spawn movie, but it was long ago. All I remember is a pretty good costume effect and Martin Sheen in a beard. <laughs>